Therefore, it is time for question period. The member from the Pink Park. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the new Minister of Health. Congratulations, Minister. Forty percent of all children who try to access mental health treatment can't get the treatment that they need. There have been a 67 percent increase in hospitalizations for children with mental health disorders over the last decade. The majority of people being treated in Ontario today in their emergency rooms after a suicide attempt are not seen by a psychiatrist within the first six months. That's six months without treatment, Minister. Other wait times are upwards of 18 months for people who are suffering from depression or anxiety. Yet this Liberal government and the NDP refuse to match the $1.9 billion federal transfer for mental health services. Why does this Question. government refuse to make the necessary investments into our mental health care system? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, on this very important uh, topic of mental health, I think uh, we really should have uh, some kind of dialogue uh, on the subject because all parties are absolutely, I think, in the same place yeah. on this particular extremely important aspect of our health. Uh, my predecessor often said there's no health without mental health. I actually feel that mental health is the most important part of our own well-being yeah. yeah. as individuals. And our government has put into place a very comprehensive plan uh, across all aspects of mental health, even starting with research, so that we understand the human brain better. Significant investments in the Brain Institute and in CAMH. Of course, we're looking Answer. at prevention. We're looking at early uh, uh, identification and treatment. The whole spectrum is being looked at, and we Thank are you. committed to doing even more than 1.9. Thank you. Supplementary, the member from Lanark, Farnett, Lennox, and Addington. Minister of Health. Mikhail was a young man in my riding, and like many of our youth, he found life was a constant struggle. His parents knew this, and they tried to get him whatever help they could. Mikhail met with social workers and doctors many, many times. He confessed to having suicidal thoughts, but was told it was just hormones. Mikhail would go on to attempt suicide three times over one year. Each, after each attempt, his parents would plead to keep him under supervision. Instead, he would be sent home and they were told to keep an eye on him and that he really didn't have a plan to kill himself. Soon after, on his fourth attempt, Mikhail did take his life. Speaker, the minister must answer as to why a youth who makes multiple suicide attempts and whose family tries and tries to find help are met with indifference. Question. Indifference that begins and ends with this ministry and the members opposite. Thank you. Yes, children and Youth Services. Sir, thank you. Ch ch children and Youth Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank the member for the question. Um, uh, there is no question on this side that um, a lot has changed in Ontario over the last uh, decade uh, in regards to mental health. Uh, there's a lot more demand uh, in the system for, for help. Um, we know that there are regions where um, there is uh, there's a longer wait list, and that's why we've moved forward with a, a new strategy uh, for mental health in Ontario. The Conservatives say that they invest 1.9 million over a decade. It's simply, it's billion, sorry. It is simply, Mr. Speaker, not enough. It is not enough of an investment. In fact, Mr. Speaker, over the last decade. As sensitive as this is, we will still maintain the decorum in this House. Please refrain. $1.9 billion, Mr. Speaker, is uh, simply not enough money. Over the last decade, this government's increased funding to mental health uh, by $10 billion. And I think that their de the demonstration of that $1.9 billion simply shows how the Conservatives are not prepared to govern this problem. Thank you. Final supplementary. A member from Stormont, Dundas, South Glengarry. Speaker, back to the minister. Our new mental health facility in Cornwall brings together many organizations under one roof, as it seeks to be a one-stop shop for residents needing mental health services. Last year at the celebration opening, we were reminded how facilities aren't enough alone. A parent rose to ask the following question, and a paraphrase: Do you mean, do you mean to tell me that if my child is diagnosed? 
with a mental health issue requiring a psychologist that one will be assigned? This, the Chief of Staff rose and very soberly said, no, we don't have any to assign. So, Speaker, when will this government listen to Ontarians and provide the, men, the right mental health services that our residents deserve and need? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, again, I think it's really important for Ontarians to understand what the Conservatives have proposed in their uh, platform. They've proposed a $1.9 billion investment over a 10-year period. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we've committed over $10 billion in the last decade, and we've made a commitment. The former Minister of Health has made a commitment, and myself and the new Minister of Health, is that we need to invest more than $1.9 billion over the next decade. And it's simply not enough to commit money. It's more about how the system uh, is organized uh, to meet the new demands in the system. That's why we've moved forward on moving on mental health, and we have lead agencies in every single part of Ontario. That's why we've built specialized— Two quick items. When you refer your answer to the chair, it helps, and uh, the, the heckling is going to have to stop. Mr. Speaker, we've made an investment into new youth hubs uh, that are built more Answer. around the lives of young people and to meet their demands, a 24-hour access drop-in uh, system. Uh, this is uh, the you. way we have to reapproach mental health here in the province. Thank you. New question, the member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. But speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health. <clears throat> speaker, my grandmother spent the last 32 years of her life because of mental illness in an institution from 1929 to 1961 when she passed away. We don't lock them away anymore, and, Speaker, that's a good thing. That's right. But we do abandon them just the same. We allow them to languish in misery and suffer just to survive without offering them the, the treatments that they need so that they, they can get through life on a daily basis. We have many agencies, agencies in my riding, like the Robbie Dean Centre, the Phoenix Center for Children and Families, but the reality is that this mental health crisis, it is time, I agree and I support the Bell Talk initiative, but it is time to do more than talk. It is time to pay attention to a serious crisis in our society Question. and ensure that the necessary resources are dedicated to helping these people who suffer from mental illness and end this crisis once and Thank for all. You. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I would say that we agree. I think all three parties in this House are on the same page. That's precisely what we've been doing since 2003. We have continued investment ever since we took office. It's grown exponentially in terms of our type of investment. We've provided, uh, there have been a lot of question about children, more than 50,000 additional children and youth access to mental health and addiction services. In terms of adults, we are providing supportive housing. There is certainly a, a huge development that is currently being undertaken in terms of 1,150 additional supportive housing units on top of the 1,000 new units that were added over the last three years. And this is going to reduce uh, some of the uh, homelessness that we see around, and, sir. and it will improve the supports for people with mental illness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the uh, Minister of Health. Uh, over the past 11 years, access to children and youth services in London and southwestern Ontario has become more increasingly difficult to access. Demand for these services is on the rise, while funding has remained stagnant. The Auditor General herself expressed grave concerns of the wait times for children and youth to access the services they need for mental health. Instead, this government invested in bureaucracy and administration, walked away from the community support agencies and froze their funding for over 10 years. In London alone, children can be expected to wait 224 days for counselling and therapy services and 226 days for intensive treatment services. My question is to the minister. Does she agree that these wait times are unacceptable? And if so, will she address the issues by committing to add and match our $1.9 billion in new funding on top of the old funding to make mental health services better for Ontarians. Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to be very clear. Our government will spend more than the proposal that we saw recently. 
by the Progressive Conservatives. We are exactly committed to that. And in our case, we know where we're going to get the funds to do so, which I think is somewhat lacking from the party opposite. Just to reiterate some of the investments that we've made, we're making additional investments of $140 million over three years, with an increase of more than $50 million every year after that to expand access to mental health services and to reduce wait times. I think one of the very important uh, programs is our province-wide, publicly funded, structured psychotherapy program that will help people with mood disorders like anxiety and Answer. depression with the supports and strategies to manage their conditions. We're going to do more than the official office. Thank you. Thank you. The member from Dufferin Caledon. Minister of Health, according to Children's Mental Health Ontario, over the last decade, there's been a 67 per cent increase in hospitalization <coughs> for kids with mental health disorders. Meanwhile, over the last 25 years, there's been a 60 per cent reduction in the capacity of children's mental health services. When the minister and I sat on the Select Committee on Mental Health and Addictions, all three parties made 23 recommendations to improve Ontario's mental health system. In the report, the minister, myself, and all committee members said, and I quote, regardless of our political convictions, we recognize that we must do better. Does the minister still endorse the 23 recommendations from the Select Committee? Thank you. Minister? Children and Youth Services. Sir, Children and Youth Services. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, um, you know, I just want to say that, um, you know, we've been on a journey here uh, uh, in Ontario to transform mental health services for young people, the way they access those services, and to meet the growing demand that is, uh, the, that's out there. Uh, we put forward uh, lead agencies right across the uh, province to create a single point of entry for young people that want to access yeah, yeah. those services. You know, and that was backed up uh, through Bill 89. We put a whole new accountability process in place. And, Mr. Speaker, that transformation piece in Bill 89 that speaks to mental health was voted against by the Conservatives here in Ontario. In fact, Mr. Speaker, I want to add this. I want to add this one piece. The Conservatives propose a $1.9 billion increase, but yet a $16 billion decrease in funding and cuts. What's going to happen to Children Youth Services here in the province of Ontario? The proposed cuts they're making through the People's Guarantee, if it's well, still your guarantee, I'm not sure if it's still the guarantee, but if it is still the guarantee, those proposed cuts alone would wipe out my entire ministry. So we need to know, is it an increase or is it cut? Thank you. Order, please. No question. The member from Welland. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Health Minister. Nancy Dimitro Bilbo is a 68 year old retired registered nurse from my riding. This past Sunday, Nancy was taken to the Welland Hospital by ambulance and spent almost 24 hours in a chair in the emergency department. Upon arrival by stretcher, she was put in a wheelchair in the waiting room. For over four hours, she was in excruciating abdominal pain. She was moaning, vomiting, dry heaving, all without yet being admitted or given anything for her pain. She ultimately spent hours in the waiting room and then hours in an uncomfortable, hard chair in the hallway of the emergency department with a pain level in the score of 0 to 10 of 12 in her words before she received anything for pain. Can the health minister explain to Nancy and her family why she received medical care Question. in a chair in a busy ER and not in a room where her privacy and dignity could be protected and her pain management could be controlled? Minister of Health, Walter, and Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And certainly when we hear uh, very sad uh, stories, as we've just heard, uh, we need to ask uh, about the circumstances. Uh, obviously, this is a particular situation, and uh, I certainly hope that the member opposite is uh, uh, liaising with my ministry, yeah. with the MPP liaison, uh, to uh, protect, particularly delve into this particular case. But uh, certainly we are addressing, on the broader sense, hospital overcrowding. We have made major investments uh, in our hospitals. Just last year, we invested nearly half a billion dollars in Ontario hospitals. And in the last 2017 budget, we invested over $500 million 
dollars, uh, representing 3.1 per cent overall increase to the hospital sector. These are significant new investments. Mm -hmm. uh, we are increasing capacity in our hospitals, and uh, uh, we, we uh, certainly intend to continue to do so. Here, Thank here, you, here. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Not only did Nancy receive her medical care in a chair in the ER instead of a bed, she was told by the physician that while her condition warranted her admission that she needed fluid monitoring and pain management, there were no beds. Nancy had two options. One was she could wait over two days for a bed, along with the 12 other people who were waiting for a bed, or she could go home. So she chose to go home because she couldn't she said she simply couldn't take any more does the health minister think it's okay that the liberal cuts to our health system that have made our hospitals so overcrowded that patients like Nancy go home before they're actually medically ready to go to do so Thank you. Minister. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, first of all, I do want to commend all our excellent frontline healthcare workers. Mr. Speaker, just last week I was at the Brantford General Hospital uh, in the uh, emergency room where we were actually increasing capacity uh, uh, to improve the services, specifically in that hospital. We are doing this type of work incrementally. We know that not only uh, can overcrowding be obviously a very difficult situation for parents, for patients, but it is also very difficult for the health Healthcare staff working in these uh, situations. But I would like to remind the member that we uh, added some 26 beds to the Niagara Health System just last fall. We're working on this issue. We will continue to do so. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, the 26 beds is not enough because all sites were actually overcrowded and overflowing. And this is not about the Welland Hospital or administrators or the frontline healthcare professionals who are actually doing their absolute best job with the underfunded resources that they are given. They've had way too many years of conservative-style budget cuts and freezes, and they just can't keep up any longer. Why won't the health minister stop talking about temporary funding, stop letting Ontario families down, and do something about the consistent overcrowding problem so that people like Nancy don't have to face this in our hospitals every day? <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, we know that our hospitals are facing increasing demands as a result of our growing and aging population, yeah. and we do commend the frontline medical staff, nursing staff, in all our facilities for the excellent work that we're doing. This year, we also uh, battled one of the worst flu seasons in years. So, in response, we have increased capacity across the continuum of care by adding 1,200 hospital beds. That's equivalent to six new medium-sized hospitals. And and in particular, we have added transitional care spaces outside of hospital for up to 1,700 patients who don't require care in a hospital. Some 150 new transitional care beds at the reactivation cent care center and acute care beds at Mackenzie Health. Uh, so we are working on this issue. We're making incremental improvements as are, as are required, and we will continue to build our excellent health care system. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. New question, the member from London West. Thank you, Speaker. My, uh, my question is to the Minister of Health. Speaker, by now, this Liberal government is quite familiar with the case of Stuart Klein, a London man who passed away on Saturday. Yesterday, Stuart's son David went on the radio and asked for an apology from the Minister of Health. David had listened to her response to my question last week and was offended to hear her say that her ministry was fully engaged in helping to coordinate this individual's return home. In fact, David says that the minister did not make one phone call to our family the entire time, neither her nor anyone who worked for her. I took that as an insult. Speaker, will the Minister of Health apologize to the Klein family for this insult? Thank you, Minister of Health. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And of course, the death of a loved one is an extremely difficult and painful experiences, and I do send my deepest condolences to the Klein family for their tragic loss. I know that the Premier also expressed her, uh, her condolences yesterday. Um, Ontario's health care system 
does stand ready to support any patient returning home with an illness or injury experienced while traveling. We know that there are beds available for critical care patients in Ontario, and so we would uh, continue to urge travel insurance to work with our uh, Lynn staff, with ministry staff, on the ground to offer protection and coordination of medical services for their clients. I know that this is a, a really horrible tragedy for the family and uh, something quite unimaginable uh, happened while their, their father was uh, out of the country. So I want to again express my deepest Thank you. condolences. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, David Klein said on the radio that it was inexcusable for the minister to try to avoid accountability for her government's role in this heartbreaking situation, which is what we just heard again. David Klein stated, what compounded the problem is that the health minister, by not taking responsibility for the problem, made it much worse. She blamed the insurance company, but the insurance company made multiple phone calls in different cities. Speaker, yesterday in this House, the Premier again pointed the finger at everyone but herself. Why is this Liberal government blaming others instead of taking responsibility for their own failings? Good question. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, we need to uh, say again that when you go out of the country and you purchase travel insurance, you are relying on that travel insurer to work with our health care system. Yeah. Um, we rely on travel insurers to do their due diligence to engage our network of hospitals here at home. Beds were available, healthcare professionals were on the ground, there was Lynn staff responsible for regional care coordination, and our staff at the ministry are willing to go the extra mile to ensure the highest quality of care yeah. for Ontarians. And so, I certainly am very committed to ensuring that that coordination communication mechanism is strengthened, uh, and yes, uh, we will probably uh, have more to say on that topic in the future. We'll Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, for decades, Ontario's hospitals have been operating with year-over-year -year cuts. This has led to hallway medicine and a chronic overcrowding crisis that is hurting families like the Kleins. Both Conservative and Liberal governments have made it a habit to cut and freeze hospital budgets. Frontline health care professionals deserve the resources necessary to treat their patients. And when an emergency happens, whether a person is in Ontario or out of the the country, they should be secure in the knowledge that our health care system will be there for them. David Klein and his family are no longer secure in that knowledge. How does this Liberal government plan to change that? Mr. Speaker, I'm going to have to uh, reiterate that there were beds available. Uh, at the level two and three type bed in ICU, on February 26, Toronto had 31 beds, the Southwest Lynn had 16 beds, the Erie St. Clair Lynn <clears throat> had seven beds, Hamilton had 34. We need to coordinate uh, information between travel insurers and the ministry, uh, and we will be working on ensuring that that communication is occurring uh, as well as is possible. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Huron Bruce. Minister of Health. Ms. Midwestern Ontario has a Schedule One facility which serves mental health patients in Godreach at Alexander Marine and General Hospital. I visited that hospital just before Christmas, but when I got to the third floor, I was very saddened with what I saw. The hospital team were hustling and bustling, and it wasn't because of the Christmas season. It was because they were hustling because they were, had people waiting in their hallways to be admitted. That's the reality that Alexandra and Marine and General Hospital faces every day. This facility consistently runs at more than 90 percent capacity year over year, and cases are becoming more complex, Speaker. The workload for staff also has continued to increase in the last two years, and just for example, the last two years specifically, it has increased 20 percent year over year. Speaker, I have to ask the minister, why is her government ignoring the growing mental health needs Question. in rural Ontario? Minister of Health, long-term care. 
Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I would certainly like to reassure the member opposite that we are doing nothing of the kind. We are working extremely hard on improving our services, uh, not only for mental health, but also for um, acute care in general. We are uh, <coughs> investing consistently for um, our hospital sector. I'm going to have to uh, again repeat that in the last budget, the 2017 budget, we invested over $500 million in funding, uh, representing a significant increase over the previous years. We are looking at the demographics of individual areas. This is uh, exactly the type of planning that our LINs are engaged in and getting the best advice as to where we need to uh, concentrate our additional efforts. I would like to mention, uh, of Answer. course, that as far as I could see, there was no money for hospitals in the PC platform. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Minister of Health. Inching towards warnings. Thank you, Speaker. Back Member. to the Minister of Health. Your Liberal government recently borrowed $25 billion for short-term hide relief, an election ploy. However, your government refused to match the $1.9 billion federal transfer for mental health services. As such, your government should have responsibility for the consequences. Wait for therapy takes too long, and sadly, as a result, suicides are on the rise. Parents like Angela Lonan, who lost her son Andrew to suicide, want the next person to have a better chance than their child did, because no one should feel they are alone. Nobody should be burying their child, Minister, when it could be prevented. Suicides don't disappear because you refuse to adequately fund children's mental health. So I say to the minister and her government, you can't afford not to make the needed investment. But since you believe otherwise, can you tell us what could be a bigger priority than saving a young life? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, certainly no family should have to endure the pain and heartache of suicide. And uh, in all cases, uh, I think uh, in all our families, uh, amongst our friends, we have seen uh, very tragic uh, situations. And this is precisely why our government in 2015 asked the Ontario Hospital Association if there was more that we could do, uh, <clears throat> particularly to work on the situation of suicide prevention. So we did establish uh, a suicide prevention task force. Uh, we recently received the report of recommendations from that task force, and we're working with our health system partners to address the recommendations made in the report as part of our ongoing work to enhance suicide prevention in Ontario. I think uh, it speaks to the fact that we really need to come together to talk Answer. openly about mental health challenges, not only to destigmatize them, but also to provide the support, supports where and when they're needed. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Speaker. Question, the member from Nickel Belt. Merci, Monsieur. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. On March 31st, this Liberal government is cutting all funding to Eat Right Ontario, the program that offers free nutritional advice to families across Ontario. My constituents and family across Northern Ontario use Eat Right extensively, in part because we don't have access to dietitian, but also because we want to make sure that our families are eating healthy foods and getting the nutrition they need. With Eat Right, people in Ontario could just pick up the phone, send an email, and get instant and reliable information from a registered dietitian about healthy eating and in many different languages. But on March 31st, this program will disappear. Why is the minister cutting funding to Eat Right Ontario and making it harder for Ontarians to eat well Question. and stay healthy? Minister of Health, Mr. Care. Speaker, and uh, while I'm not familiar with the particular service that the member opposite is speaking about, of course I certainly concur that uh, healthy. Eating is fundamental to our health. As a former medical officer of health, certainly public health units are very involved in this particular area. And uh, we know that uh, we encourage healthy eating across the spectrum, starting, of course, with our kids. Uh, we know that uh, the healthier our kids are, the less chronic disease they'll have later on in life. And so, certainly, um, 
with the uh, encouragement of the member opposite, I believe she actually had a private member's bill, we've done things like our menu labeling legislation that came into effect January 1, 2017. Uh, this was named the Healthy Menu Choices Act. And so the, we're already posting calories on menus mm -hmm. uh, to help people uh, make the healthy Answer. choices that they should. So we're working in this regard uh, across the province. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. The dietitians of, Can of Canada who have run Eat Right Ontario for the last 10 years say they are, and I quote, extremely disappointed with the government's decision. And so are the families in my riding who count on Eat Right Ontario to help them stay healthy. Like the minister just said, healthy eating is a primary factor in maintaining wellness, healthy growth and development, as well as prevention and management of major chronic diseases. You have diabetes, celiac disease, bowel obstruction. You don't know what food is safe for you. You call Eat Right Ontario and they help you. You need to lose weight. You need to prevent heart disease. You want to eat healthy, call Eat Right Ontario. It is there to help or was there to help. This is an incredibly important services for the people of Ontario, and especially Question. the people are represented in Northern Ontario. Why is this minister cutting funding to Eat Right Ontario? Thank you. Minister. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, I certainly will um, investigate this particular situation with, uh, I'm not familiar with precisely this particular agency, but I can say that across this province, we do have a number of services uh, to ensure that uh, our population gets uh, healthy food. Uh, the student nutrition programs in so many schools that are available, as well as public health units. It's one of the standards in, under the Health Protection and Promotion Act that we ensure that our population has access to information related to to um, healthy eating. And so, um, while uh, uh, we are very conscious that we do have issues, certainly uh, in relation to childhood obesity, um, we have many programs that are looking to uh, reversing this trend, Answer. and uh, we will continue to do so. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Thank you. New question. The member from Etobicoke North. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This question is for the Minister of Environment and climate change. Speaker, the question concerns our uh, remarkable sale of the cap-and-trade auction. Speaker, climate change is real. Extreme weather events, fluctuating temperatures, they all have real effects, including on human health. And our auction was recently a sellout, at raising almost half a billion dollars. But, Speaker, a responsible government has to have a credible, costed plan. And I've actually been reviewing the People's Guarantee, Speaker, and all I can see from it is a kind of ostrich-like running away from climate change. From what I can see, Speaker, all that it does is that it guarantees. Uh, uh, first, um, you're, you're going to have to put that one piece down because I can see that it is a prop, so I'm going to ask the member to put that down. And second of all, as I said yesterday, let's relate it to the government. You can make that short introduction, but talk about policy. Please carry on. Thank you, Speaker. I accept your advice and get rid of it right now. Speaker, every cent of those proceeds is required by law to be invested in programs that reduce pollution. And these programs that are green on climate change program is improving cycling infrastructure, retrofits for hospitals, schools, and transit. Speaker, so my question is this to the government minister. Can you please explain to the House Thank how you. a successful plan is reducing pollution in Ontario? Thank you, Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to uh, the member from Etobicoke North for his passion uh, in that important question. I know as a medical doctor, uh, the member is well aware of the threat that climate change poses to our health. And as the member mentioned, Ontario generated $471 million in proceeds from our first joint cap and invest auction with the California and Quebec Speaker. This goes to show that businesses are confident in our carbon market and that the market is functioning as planned. We've seen that businesses, as well as independent, ex independent experts, agree that our cap on pollution is the best way to put a price on carbon, Speaker. Our program not only reduces pollution from businesses, it does so at the lowest price possible. 
In January, Speaker, the, the Independent Environment Commissioner of Ontario said Ontario's linked cap and invest program will save almost all of us money. We're proud to stand on this, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Supplementary. Speaker, I find the minister's answer particularly reliable, credible, and intelligent. Far more sensible. Far more sensible, Speaker. Speaker, as I was saying, I find the minister's response far more reliable, credible, and intelligent than the previous money-back guarantee, which I dare not name any further. <laughs> Speaker, just yesterday, the minister announced the Green On Challenge, which will award $300 million to businesses, nonprofits, and other organizations for projects that will reduce pollution in the province of Ontario. It's about investing in Ontario's future and creating a fairer society, Mr. not the ostrich-like approach of others. Speaker, my question is this. Can the Minister, please tell the House how our plan is investing in green solutions for the benefit of Thank all you. Ontarians. Minister. Well. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, a thank you to the member for, uh, uh, for Etobicoke North, uh, and I agree with everything he said. <laughs> Speaker, our plan is helping Ontarians fight climate, cha climate change and save money. Uh, meanwhile, Speaker, we are so disappointed to see the PCs refuse to take climate change seriously. Speaker, uh, the environment is too important to be ignored. Climate change, Speaker is too important to be, uh, to be ignored. Uh, a, a plan that turns its back on climate change and leaves a $9.6 billion hole in addition to $16 billion is not one that is acceptable to this government or the people of That's Ontario. Right. Speaker. We are investing in this province, Speaker, through our proceeds from Cap and Invest. We are making Thank social you. housing better and schools better. Thank you. New question, the member from Whitby, Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. My question, my question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. A 2017 survey conducted by the Ontario Student Trustees Association found that one in three students, Speaker, concluded that their school mental health resources and supports are grossly inadequate. More recently, Speaker, the Association's 2018 election platform calls on the government to fund suicide intervention and mental health training programs to deal with this mental health crisis. The Ontario Progressive Conservative Party has already responded by matching the federal government's commitment of $1.9 billion for mental health resources, particularly, Speaker, topping up elementary and secondary school mental health supports. When will the Liberal government, Russia. Speaker, finally address the growing mental health crisis in Ontario schools? Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Minister of Education. Minister of Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member opposite for his question. I also want to say uh, that I want to thank the Ontario Student Trustees Association for their advocacy, and uh, we will absolutely continue to meet with them regularly to, to look at various ways that we can support our school systems and our school community and certainly our students. Speaker, mental health and the challenges our young people are facing today is something that I absolutely take as a priority in in our government and in our school system. That's because, that's because we know that children are facing more and more challenges when it comes to some of the things and the issues that they're facing today. Schools are dealing with panic attacks. They're dealing with children for having anxiety issues. They're dealing with children suffering from depression. And so I want you to know that we care deeply and that I care deeply about this. And so I am absolutely proud Thanks, to work for a government that has stepped up and is addressing some of these challenges by providing already an an additional $49 million over the next three years, and I'm happy to talk Thank you. Supplementary, the member from Thank you to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. 
Mr. Speaker, the College Student Alliance, the Ontario Undergraduate Student Alliance, Colleges Ontario and the Council of Ontario Universities prepared a report entitled In It Together, Taking Action on Student Mental Health. In the report, the four partners explain that providing effective support for student mental health is one of the most pressing issues on college and university campuses today, and that post-secondary institutions have made addressing it a priority but can't meet the challenge alone. Mr. Speaker, representatives of the organizations visited Queen's Park last fall and sh shared their difficult stories, including students who volunteered to intervene in crisis situations on our campuses. Will the minister tell our students and educators why they have underfunded campus mental health support, forcing vulnerable students to take care of each other? Question. Thank you. Minister of Education. Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development. Minister of Advanced Education. Thank you, Speaker, and um, thank you for the opportunity to rise in the House and to talk about this very important issue, Speaker. We know that uh, when students uh, go off to a post-secondary institution, a college or a university, that that is a very stressful and difficult time for them. It can be, Speaker. It's a, oftentimes it's the first time that they're away from home and they need the supports uh, to be in place as they're away from their families and their friends. Mr. Speaker, we are well aware of this uh, of this issue, and uh, in fact, our, our government has taken significant action. Uh, that is why, beginning in this school year, we are investing an additional six million dollars annually in uh, mental health supports over the next three years. This brings our total investment to $15 million annually so that uh, our campuses can be uh, places where students are, are feeling that they have the supports that they need. Here, here. They yes, have um, a 24-hour, 24, 24, 24 hours a day, seven days a week uh, helpline. Uh, we know that students oh. need supports around the clock, and those supports here, are in place. Thank you. New question, the member from Hamilton Mountain. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Children and Youth Services. Yesterday, I raised a question about Kanina Sue Turtle, who filmed her own suicide while she was left alone for 45 minutes in a foster home in Sioux Lookout. Her family wants to know what happened. In response, the minister said that he is always available to any family that wants to connect. But this is simply unacceptable. The onus should not be put on a grieving family to reach out to the minister. It doesn't help this family, and it certainly doesn't help the thousands of First Nation and Métis families with loved ones in care. I ask again, will the minister tell this family what happened to Kanina? Thank you, Minister of Children and Resources. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, since becoming the minister responsible for children and youth services in this province, I found that these, uh, these types of issues are often the most complex and most challenging. On the very surface, it is also um, quite heartbreaking uh, to hear these stories uh, that, um, that come uh, from many places across this uh, province. And, um, you know, I, I often think about the, uh, the family and the pain that they're going through, so my heart goes out to the family. And, um, you know, I'll say it again, that um, I've always uh, been willing to meet with any family. But, you know, to have this type of conversation, you know, across, uh, across uh, you know, a, a legislature about a personal story that's taking place and, you know, this, uh, this challenge that this one family is going, this is not the appropriate place to have this conversation. And um, I will meet with the family. And, um, you know, Mr. Speaker, I've met with many families across this province. I've been throughout all of Northern Ontario talking to families about the challenges that they're going through. Thank you. Supplementary. Now, that was an inappropriate response. This is the place where we raise the issues of the people of this province. Last May, in this place, I raised Kanina's death along with those of other Indigenous children who died in group homes. At that time, I called on the minister to institute mandatory inquests into the deaths of all children in care. Instead, I understand the coroner is doing a review of 11 deaths, and we're not sure if Kanina's death is one of them. We must know what has happened so that we can stop the deaths of young people in care. Will the minister find it appropriate to inquire and have a full inquest that is open and transparent so that lives can be saved? Thank you. The senior, please. The senior, please. 
Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think that um, you know, all young people in this province deserve to feel safe. And um, if they need help or if a family needs help, there needs to be places for them to go. And um, that's why we've updated our, our uh, legislation in the province of Ontario to, uh, to make sure that there is more accountability and more transparency in the system. We've updated our blueprint um, that changes uh, the very way in which uh, the whole sector is regulated. You know, this is a, a family who's gone through um, a lot of pain. Um, there's a um, you know there's a lot of privacy issues in regards to this uh, this particular case, and I think it's completely inappropriate for the member to politicize this issue. Exactly. You know I think that if she really if she really wants to help the family, exactly. if she really wants to help the family, then come and talk to me and let's see what way we can do it. If she wants to talk about policy and regulation that govern the way in which young people are treated in this province, then that's a completely different thing. But stop politicizing this important issue. New question. Member from Guelph. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is for the minister responsible for small business. You know, Speaker, we keep hearing from the opposition. You'll join them. Speaker, we keep hearing from the opposition parties that our economy is struggling and that we're neglecting our business community. But in fact, we know that this just simply isn't the case. And we know that Ontario continues to drive national economic growth. In fact, we've created nearly 800,000 jobs, net new jobs, since the recession. Our unemployment rate is the lowest in 17 years and under the national average for 33 straight months. It's important that we ensure our businesses and communities are thriving and continue to create good local jobs. And in fact, just yesterday, the minister was in my riding of Guelph to announce our partnership Question. with Sleeman Breweries. So, uh, Speaker, through you, can the minister please tell us how this government is supporting regional Thank economic you. growth? Minister of Agriculture, Food, Rural Affairs, and Responsible for Small Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from Guelph for that question. Mr. Speaker, last month, the Ontario Chamber of Commerce contributing BMO economists said that Ontario's underlying macroeconomics are the best they've been in decades. Investing in regional economic development is a smart thing to do. Through our Southwestern Ontario Development Fund, We've committed $163 million in funding support, leverage over $1.9 billion in investments. We're helping to support over 40,000 local good-paying jobs. Just yesterday, I had the privilege of partnership with Sleeman Breweries to support over 425 local highly skilled dwells in Guelph, Ontario. Our support will help Sleeman bring back production to Guelph for the United States of 100,000 hectoliters of beer from the United States to Ontario and grow good jobs while investing in advanced manufacturing technology. This is part Answer. of our plan to create opportunities for our highly skilled workers and to ensure Ontario's food and beverage processors remain the best in the world. Thank you. Supplementary. Member from Barrie. Thank you, Minister, for your answer. It's clear to me that this government is working diligently to make sure that we're supporting our communities and our businesses. The opposition parties would like the people of Ontario to believe that we're not doing anything to help businesses invest and grow in this province. This simply isn't true. And unlike their plan that guarantees nothing but cuts, cuts and more cuts, we are investing in jobs right here, right now, at home. They're fear-mongering in that increasing minimum wage will force employers to reduce staff by bringing in automation is also false. 
Just last week, I was joined by the Minister of Economic Development and Growth to announce funding for innovative automation in my own riding of Barrie. This is another great example of how Question. our government continues to support economic growth in local communities. Will the minister please tell us more about the importance of our regional economic development program? No, minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member from Barry for that supplementary question. We're working hard to make sure our plan moves everyone forward. We're making sure families can take advantage of our economic benefits. We're also ensuring business keep investing in Ontario. And as the member from Barry said, last week we announced our partnership with Barry's Innovative Automation. In this great case, how robots are actually creating jobs, this will create 29 new jobs and keep 102 existing positions. We're helping this facility expand in Barrie and make sure that over 130 people have good-paying jobs in that wonderful community. And what's even great is innovative automation will employ a lot of local talent. About one quarter of the facility staff are Georgian College graduates. Whoa, the facility also does a large portion of its business within two kilometers of the new location. This is how our plan is working to help support our local economy and keep Ontario competitive, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question? The member from uh, Niagara West Randall. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, I recently had the opportunity to go on a ride-along with officers from the Niagara Regional Police Services, and I had the chance on this ride-along to learn more about the cost and impact of inadequate mental health funding in my community. And while I was with these officers, we received an MHA call, a mental health apprehension call. And these frontline officers shared many real-life stories with me uh, about the harm caused by this government's fa failure to invest in preventative mental health services. Uh, most calls these officers receive are to deal with people who are having a mental health crisis, people who could have been helped by earlier intervention. Will the minister commit today to matching the federal transfer for mental health to help my constituents and to enable the officers of my community to focus on policing? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, the member's question uh, raises an important point, uh, and that point is that so many of our individual government ministries are involved in looking and tackling the issues around mental health, and that's precisely why we've established a mental health wellness table uh, amongst our ministries where in collaboration with the Minister of Health, the Minister of Education, the Minister of Children and Youth Services, the Minister of Community Safety and Corrections are sitting uh, talking about the issues and how the uh, aspects of mental health do inf uh, impact on so many different uh, government services. This is a very important initiative. Uh, we, of course, have uh, increased our community supports mm -hmm. through the years, and uh, I'm sure your police force is well aware of that as well. Uh, we have had uh, the increase in Answer. terms of supportive housing, uh, the integrated youth hubs that uh, uh, my colleague, the Minister of Children and Youth, is uh, announcing uh, or has announced. And so, yes, Thank it's you. a complex problem, and we're working on it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. The Select Committee on Mental Health and Addictions reviewed frontline services that included 24-7 mobile crisis intervention teams for adults and children, as well as crisis centres. They were interested by the possibility that these service officers offer, the services offered were very impressive and some of the innovative initiatives already in place around the province could help. Initiatives like the Crisis Outreach and Support Team, or COAST, which partners health and social service personnel with police officers. In fact, the Select Committee recommended supporting these models. Mr. Speaker, why is the government failing to offer these much-needed mental health support services to our frontline workers? Thank you. Community Safety and Correctional Services. Mr. Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you very much, actually, for the questions because it gives me a chance, actually, Mr. Speaker, to acknowledge what we are hearing all throughout our province that, you know what, there is a need to transform our system, and mental health is definitely a key part. And one thing that I'm very proud to share today is that for the first time in our Police Services Act, we're introducing a community safety well being plan. 
And this will be something that each municipality, looking with their organization, with their policing partners, with their mental health organization, looking together in finding ways and solutions to address what the member opposite is sharing. I did some ride along myself, Mr. Speaker, and to be very frank, the police are asking for us to, to give tools, to give extra Answer. availability to look at this gap. So, Mr. Speaker, I'm very proud that our government is Thank taking you. action. Thank you. Your question, the member from Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. Decades of cuts and stagnant funding by this Liberal government have pushed our mental health system into crisis. Windsor seniors are waiting months for mental health services, and many with specialized mental health needs, like dementia, are being placed in acute care because there is nowhere else for them to go. But there's an easy way to help alleviate this crisis. Hotel Du Grace Healthcare in Windsor has available beds. The units are built and ready to go. Brand new unit. All they need is the financial support of this government so that the beds can be fully operational and seniors can be placed appropriately. Ministry staff have toured the units and acknowledged the need to get them open. The minister herself said this morning mental health is the most important part of our well-being. Will the Minister of Health commit today to provide the funds needed for Question. Hotel Du Grace so that seniors with complex needs can get the help they need without delay? Thank you. Mr. Health, long -term Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, to the member opposite, uh, my former critic, and uh, obviously in action here today, I'd say this is a, a very <clears throat> important question, and uh, I know that uh, this is precisely what we are looking at across the province. Where do we have gaps in service, yeah. and how can we address them? She uh, mentioned specifically uh, seniors with complex needs, including dementia, and uh, of course we've had uh, a very robust dementia strategy in this province, and uh, we have committed to ensuring that people living with dementia and their fa families feel supported. They continue to be treated with the dignity and respect that they deserve. So within the 2017 budget, our government announced an additional investment of $101 million over three years for, for the Ontario Dementia yes, Strategy. And this will improve coordination of care, strong partnerships between primary care and specialist uh, physicians and community care Thank providers. You. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the uh, Minister of Health. Perhaps she didn't hear me. It's it's a fully ready-to-go turnkey, turnkey wing just waiting for the hospital to receive operational funding so they can bring seniors out of acute care into the care they need to actually provide them the dignity you claim that they deserve. Seniors that have worked their entire lives to better this province should get mental health services when they need them, and they should expect the same for their children and grandchildren. But we need to do more than just tinker with the same broken system, the same underfunded system. It's time for something completely different. That's why New Democrats have promised an overhaul and, for the first time, a comprehensive Ministry of Health and Addiction Services. Will the Minister of Health admit that Windsor families deserve better, give Hotel Du Grace the financial resources that they need now, and commit to our plan to Question. deliver a Ministry of Mental Health and Addiction Services so we fix this crisis once and for all? Thank you, Minister. <clears throat> Our government, uh, Mr. Speaker, has made these commitments, and uh, we will be looking at all potential applicants for funding over the next uh, short while. And uh, particularly to the member from Windsor, I would say that uh, <clears throat> it's absolutely clear that uh, somehow she missed our 2017 budget. We've invested over $500 million in funding to Ontario hospitals for expansion of services. This is precisely what we're doing. Our transitional care beds, our um, supportive housing initiatives, this is all part of the puzzle, Mr. Speaker. We're working hard. We will continue to do so. We are absolutely committed to ensuring that all Ontarians live in the kind of dignity Answer. and respect that they deserve. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.
New question, the member from Scarborough, Agent Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the minister responsible for accessibility. Speaker, our government has done more on the area of accessibility than any other previous government. True. With the creation of the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disability Act, our government has set forth to make Ontario accessible by 2025. Speaker, milestones were set in form of standards, and most have been reached, but there's more work to be done. In my riding of Scarborough Asian Court, I know my residents are keen to learn more about this work. In, in addition to existing enforceable standards that are already in place, Speaker, through you to the Minister, can she please inform the House the status of the standard for accessibility in education? Thank you. Minister of Government Services and responsible for disability. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for um, Scarborough Asian Court for this important uh, question and her local work in her community to identify and remove barriers for all people in Ontario. So, Speaker, it's Tuesday morning, and I'm asking you and everyone to imagine Ontario's classrooms. And images that are brought to my mind range from kindergarten students creating finger painting works of art to high school students doing some last minute studying before their big math test. And as I reflect on that, Speaker, I have to reflect on what this looks like for students with disabilities. Are they getting everything they deserve from the education system? Will they have the resources that they need? Are there barriers uh, that they face in being the best students that they can possibly be? So that's why I'm so pleased to confirm that we have established two new standards development committees uh, in the education sector, one for K to 12 and Answer. one post secondary, and I'll be pleased to speak more about that in the supplementary. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, and thanks to the minister for her response and providing the leadership on the area of accessibility. The work of the Accessibility Director of Ontario is of utmost importance in this government and is continuing to create the most open, accessible, and just society in North America. In my diverse, diverse riding of Scarborough Asian Court, I know my residents, and especially young people, are keen to learn more about the new two standards and as well as the committee. Speaker, through you to the minister, can she please inform the House the composition of this committee and how the work they plan to do in accomplishing this goal? Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, I think, again, it's a very important topic here to talk about uh, accessibility in Ontario. And the question about how these committees do their work is an important one, too, because these committees help create a more inclusive education system uh, so all students can reach their potentials. And the diverse committees are made up of different kinds of people, Speaker, people with lived experiences, education, administrators, students, teachers, and parents. And forming these new standards in the sector are a real milestone in the evolution of the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disability Act. By everyone bringing their skills and experience together, it makes a brighter future for our students who will benefit from these new accessibility standards in our education sector. And that, that will impact children from when they start school speaker right through to when they go to college and universities. I'm very pleased to confirm that Lynn Zerado is chairing our kindergarten Answer. to grade 12 standard development committee, and Tina Doyle is chairing our post-secondary accessibility standards committee. Thank yep. you, Speaker. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member from Whitby, Oshawa, has given notice of his dissatisfaction to the answer to his question given by the Minister of Health Long-Term Care concerning mental health. This matter will be debated today at 6 p.m. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member from Huron-Bruce has given notice of her dissatisfaction of her question given by the minute the answer uh, her question given by the the answer given by the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care concerning mental health needs. Uh, rural mental health needs. This matter will be debated tomorrow at 6 p.m. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member from Niagara West Glanbrook has given notice. I'm not satisfied. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member from Niagara West Glanbrook has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Minister of Health and Long Term Care concerning mental health. This matter will be debated tomorrow at 6 p.m. We have a deferred vote on the motion of second reading of Bill 194, an act respecting fairness in procurement. Call on the members. This will be a five-minute bill.
members, please take your seats. February 26, 2018. February 26, 2018, Ms. McMahon moves second reading of Bill 194, an act respecting fairness in procurement. All those in favor, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Nack. Mr. Nack. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Sandal. Mr. Sandal. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dahmer. Mr. Dahmer. Mr. Verniel. Mr. Verniel. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Madame De Rosie. Madame De Rosie. Mr. Codd. Mr. Codd. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Manga. Mrs. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Madame Gelina. Madame Gelina. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Tavis. Mr. Tavis. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Ms. Satton. Ms. Satton. Ms. Satton. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. The ayes are 89, the nays are 1. The ayes being 89, the nays being 1, I declare the motion carried. Pursuant to the order of the House dated March 5, 2018, the bill is ordered for third reading. We have a deferred motion on the Government Notice of Motion No. 63 relating to allocation of time on Bill 175, an act to implement measures with respect to policing, coroners, forensic laboratories, and to enact, amend, or repeal certain other statutes and revoke regulations. Call on the members. This will be a five-minute bill. On March 5, 2018, Ms. Uh, Madame uh, De Rose moved the Government Notice of Motion 63 relating to the allocation of time on Bill 175, an act to implement measures with respect to policing, coroners, and forensic laboratories, and to enact, amend, repeal certain other statutes and revoke a regulation. All those in favor of the motion, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nack. Mr. Nack. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Susan. Mr. Susan. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. 
Charles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Matthews. Mr. Matthews. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Barnett. Mr. Barnett. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dahmer. Mr. Dahmer. Mr. Verniel. Mr. Verniel. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. Mr. Codd. Mr. Codd. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Manga. Mrs. Manga. Mr. Kraft. Mr. Kraft. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogar. Ms. Hogar. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. All those opposed, please rise. One at a time, be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Miller, Perry, Sal, Muskoka. Mr. Miller, Perry, Sal, Muskoka. Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. Yurik. Mr. Yurik. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Ms. Shubisson. Mr. Shubisson. Mr. Vanton. Mr. Vanton. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Tabbs. Mr. Tabbs. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Gretzky. Mr. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. The ayes are 51, the nays are 40. The ayes being 51, the nays being 40, I declare the motion carried. We have a deferred vote on the motion to second reading of Bill 196, an act to authorize the expenditure of certain amounts in the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2018. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bill. Same vote? Same vote. The ayes are 51, the nays are 40. The ayes being 51 and the nays being 40, I declare the motion carried. Second reading of the bill, deuxième lecture du projet de loi. Order, one, order G196, third reading of Bill 196, an act to authorize the expenditure for certain amounts for the fiscal year ending March 31, 2018. Minister. Speaker, I move third reading of Bill 196, an act to authorize the expenditure of certain amounts for the fiscal year ending March 31, 2018. It was third reading of Bill 196. Do we agree? <laughs> oh. Is it the pleasure of the House to motion carry? I heard a no. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say nay. Yeah. In my opinion, the ayes have it. Calling the members, this will be a five minute bell. Same vote. Same vote. The ayes are 51, the nays are 40. The ayes being 51 and the nays being 40, I declare the motion carried. Reading the bill, troisième lecture du projet de loi. Be it resolved that the bill do now pass and be entitled as in the motion. We have a deferred vote on the motion for third reading of Bill 193, an act to enact Rowan's Law Concussion uh, Safety 2018 and to amend the Education Act. Call on the members, this will be a five minute bill.
Uh, did it earlier today, Ms. Vermeil moved third reading of Bill 193, an act to enact a Rowan's Law con uh, Concussion Safety 2018 to amend various acts. All those in favor, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Ms. Vermeil. Ms. Vermeil. Mr. Knack. Mr. Knack. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Mrs. Albanese. Mrs. Albanese. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Domerlo. Mr. Domerlo. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. Oh. McGarry. Mr. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Madame de Rosie. Madame de Rosie. Mr. Codd. Mr. Codd. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mrs. Manga. Mrs. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Don. Mr. Don. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Hardy. Mr. Hardy. Mr. Hardy. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Samuskoka. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Ostrov. Mr. Ostrov. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Dancock. Mr. Dancock. Mr. Angelina. Mr. Angelina. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. I know you. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Vice Mayor, time to be recognized by the clerk. The ayes are 91, the nays are zero. The ayes being 91 and the nays being zero, I declare the motion carried. Be it resolved that the bill be now passed and be entitled as in the motion. Deferred votes. This House stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.